Today is known as, as Pentecost Sunday, and so 50 days after Easter. Can you believe it's been 50 days since Easter? Isn't that wild? Feels like it was just a few, a few weeks ago, really. But 50 days after Easter, we, we have Pentecost Sunday, and uh, it's just a powerful reminder that God is with us. A powerful reminder that, that uh, there's more, that God always has more. And I, I think that that's, uh, it, it's encouraging, it's, it's also a challenging to know that, that in this Christian journey, I think Leonard Ravenhill, he was a, um, a thinker, a theologian, and he talked about this journey with God, and he said, it's like climbing a mountain. And as soon as you feel like you've, you've, you've reached the climax or the peak of the mountain, the, the clouds part, and there's another mile to journey. And one thing I've found in, in life is that God always has more. You know, it can feel like, well, maybe, maybe I've experienced all there is to experience. Or if you've been in church for a long time, I, I know just about all there is to know. I think I've, I've, I've been baptized 17 times, saved 23. You know, I, I've, 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 it's been, I mean, I've been dunked and anointed with more oil than you can, you can fry 38 chickens. You know, like I've, I've experienced it all and... But I don't, I don't think we ever get to that point, or we shouldn't. Because if we're alive, and everyone in here I'm, I'm speaking to I know is, or outside in the courtyard, God always has more. And what I love, one of the things I love about spending time with, with, with new believers is that they're, just, they're always filled with excitement and wonder. Have you ever noticed that? How many, has anyone in here, you've been, you've been a Christian less than, than a year? Anybody? You, it's okay. You, nobody's going to bite you. No, so y'all have been saved a long time. Okay. How about five years? Let's, okay, we got a, a couple. I, I love spending time with, with, with folks that have just, you know, may, maybe new to the faith because everything is so wonderful to them. Everything's exciting. Like, they, whatever's going on at the church, they want to be there. <laughs> if it's a prayer meeting, if it's, if it's volunteering, if it's serving, because they're just, it's all new to them. And it seems like over time that, that the newness, the newness can kind of wear off. Like with cars, with houses, you know, you, you first get that car, you keep it immaculate, you want to show it, you know, you're, you're taking it to the car wash three days a week, like it's, you want to show it off, you're, you're finding all these new features in it, you're reading the instruction manual, and then eventually you're eating Big Macs, you know what I'm saying, driving down the road, you, know, you get just, you just, you don't care anymore, but... You sit down with a new believer, they're hungry. They want to know, you know, what is this prayer? What is this, what is worship? Why, why do people lift their hands? Why do we sing? Like, they're full of questions. They're full of excitement. And the Bible is full of people that have, have been captured with wonder, but there's, it's also full of people who've lost their wonder. Full of it. Of people that have, have journeyed with God for a, quite a while, and then they just kind of take it for granted. The children of Israel comes to mind. I think about the children of Israel, and here they are. They were in, in bondage for hundreds of years to a guy named Pharaoh. And we all know the story. They were, they were miraculously led out of Egypt through the God parts the Red Sea. Incredible. They had a fire, a pillar of fire at night to light up their camp. And they followed this pillar of fire at night in a cloud during the day. And even those folks lost the wonder wasn't even a few weeks they were in they were in the, the wilderness heading to the promised land and they start complaining <laughs> god we don't like the food god we don't really like that we don't like the temperature we don't like this we don't like we want to go back to egypt god the, the the newness war i mean a fire at night a cloud during the day god is showing up for them over and over and over and they just kind of lost the wonder Solomon, I think about Solomon, supposedly the wisest person that's ever lived apart from Jesus. People all over the world talked about the wisdom of Solomon. It was a gift that God gave him. He kind of had a genie in a bottle experience. And God said, I'm going to give you one wish, anything you ask for. Wouldn't that be nice? And he wasn't driving a Bentley. You know, he, he, he didn't ask for stuff. He asked for wisdom. And so he had incredible wisdom, and, and, and he was known for this wisdom throughout the land. The first chapter, the first verse of the book that he wrote in Ecclesiastes, everything is meaningless. 
Meaningless, I tell you. Everything is meaningless. He talked about all the toil under the sun and what is it worth. He lost his wonder. I think about the book of Revelation that we're studying right now. In the first, uh, first three chapters, the church known as the church of Laodicea. And this is a church that experienced God. They, they had so much just, just, I mean, it's amazing what they had experienced, the good things of God. And then, and then they get a correction in the book of Revelation. It says, you're not hot, you're not cold. You've lost your wonder. I'd, I'd rather you be, you know, either hot or cold, but you're lukewarm. Because you're lukewarm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, do, do, it was really strong warning. So I'm just going to spit you out of my mouth because they, they, they lost their wonder. I think we do that with a lot of things in life, right? You've heard the saying, familiarity breeds contempt. And we get comfortable with it. And, and, and if we're rounded enough, you know, we go to church quite a bit. Now, new believers don't have this experience, but those that have been saved for a long time, and thankfully we have folks like that in our church as well, that have been serving God for a long time. And, 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 and oftentimes like, we, we kind of talk about what God used to do. <laughs> Back, back, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the, re, the revivals have passed. And, and, and it's almost like it's, it's something that's in history that God is not going to do anything special again. We kind of lose the, the wonder. There's these seven, have you heard of the seven wonders of the world? There's like the ancient wonders. Then there's the modern wonders. There's like the Great Wall of China. And I looked them all up, never been to any of them. But there's all these, you know, the, 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 the pyramids. That's, one of the, that's the only ancient wonder that still exists, is the, the, the pyramids in Egypt. And those are pretty amazing. If you just think about how those things were built, according, apparently even today, if we tried or attempted to build those pyramids with, with the tools they had access to when they built those pyramids, we couldn't do it. So it's known as a wonder of the world. But as I was looking through these seven wonders, modern and ancient, I noticed that they were... They were all created by man. And what I'm finding in, in my life is that there's things that God wants us to wonder about. And we've been going through this book, the book of Revelation, which is probably one of the most like imagery filled, like just, just incredible things that we've went through over the last several weeks. And we're, we're laying in the plane on this book. And I'm starting to, to see that maybe some of the things written in this book weren't meant to be understood. <laughs> maybe they were meant to just be wondered at. Like, wow, look at God. <laughs> In the middle of all this chaos, in the middle of all this stuff, and, and he, he kind of rolls out the rest of history for us to, to see what's going to happen in the future. And maybe it's not for us to completely understand. Maybe there's some things that God just wants us to wonder and, and know that no matter what happens on this side of eternity, that God is always going to be faithful in your life. And I think if, if we could boil it all down, the book of Revelation and all that there's all these different angels and creatures and we talked about some of those last week supernatural beings and there's there's a lot of the number seven is over and over and over there's seven trumpets and seven bowls and and seven seven year tribulation and there's all there's so much there but maybe it's there for us to just look at and say wow <laughs> God's got this that word wonder, Webster defines it as a feeling of surprise. So, a feeling of mingled with admiration caused by something beautiful, unexpected, unfamiliar, or inexplicable. When was the last time you were overcome by wonder? Gallup did a study a couple years ago. And I think we're seeing this play out in our, in our world right now, known as the Great Resignation. And they interviewed people about their jobs, their work. And they found that 90% of people they interviewed had just kind of lost their wonder in what they were doing. They were just going to work to get a check. It was just kind of checking the box. It was a duty. No delight in it. Heard a story about a, a couple that had been married a long time. And they were, they kind of lost that fire. 
right? They, they lost that passion for one another. And so the, the wife convinced the husband to go to counseling. And, and they go to counseling, and, and they, they're, they're sitting there with the counselor, and she's just, you know, telling about how when they first got married, I, I mean, they were inseparable. In, in the car, you couldn't tell if it was one person or two driving. They just were glued at the hip, right? And always holding hands, always kissing, and she's telling the counselor, he doesn't even kiss me anymore. It's like we just kind of live together. We're like roommates. So the counselor got up and just kissed her right on the lips. <laughs> Looked at the husband and said, she needs this three days a week. He said, all right, I'll bring her here Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. <laughs> Lost the wonder. <laughs> it can happen. But I think, this is what I think. God wants to fill your life with wonder. God wants you to live. Jesus said it like this. If you want to see the kingdom of God... The only way you're going to see it is if you become a little child. And a little child is always in wonder because everything he sees is for the first time. He's just blown away. I love that about my, my son. I mean, starting on Monday, he'll ask, is it church tomorrow? Tuesday, hey, is it church tomorrow? Wednesday, hey, is it church tomorrow? And I'm kind of doing the opposite. I'm like, is it church tomorrow? Because I got to preach. You know what I'm saying? You know, I'm like, am I? You know, I'm, I'm counting the days. Like, I need an extra day before Sunday. And he's just ready to get there. Because he's just, he's just like, you know, he's filled with wonder. Kids are filled with wonder. It's like everything they see is for the first time. And so they're excited. They're passionate. God wants us to live our life filled with wonder. Not wonder with what's going on in the world or wonder with who's going to bomb who or who's going to do this or who's threatening who or what world economic system is collapsing right now. That's not the kind of wonder he wants you to have. He wants you to wonder at his faithfulness and his goodness in your life. He wants you to wonder that even when you look out and you look around the world and it seems like nobody has a plan because they don't, he does. And he's faithful and he's good. And in the middle of whatever is unleashed on this planet, he is going to have a church and he's going to take care of them. In Revelation 10, it's, it's, it's the longest vision that John receives one revelation. Here, here's John on the Isle of Patmos. Let me tell you, John did not lose the wonder in his life. He's in his 90s, y'all. He's already written a, a couple of books that are in the Bible. He spent time with Jesus, walked with him every day. And now, because of that, he's a prisoner on the Isle of Patmos. History tells us he's cutting granite for a living. But he didn't lose the wonder. It says when he received this revelation, he fell at the feet of, of, of Jesus, who was the first vision, as he, he just was blown away. Kind of like the first time you, you see one of the natural wonders of the world, right? Or the Niagara Falls, or you see something so spectacular, it just takes your breath away. When he had this vision, this revelation, it just says he fell at the feet of Jesus like he was dead. He was just, <laughs> just overwhelmed. And so he gives, he's, receives these visions, and Here's, here's one of the longest visions that he receives. I'm just going to read a few verses. But he, gets, he sees this vision of this angel. I'm going to show it to you first. William Blake, he, he painted it, this mighty angel. And he's got one foot on the land. And he's got one foot on the sea. He's got this tiny scroll in his hand. It said his voice was like the voice of, of, of thundering. And, and let, me, let me just read it to you. Revelation 10, it says, I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun. His legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea, left foot on the land, and he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. Verse 4. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven say, Seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. I love that that's there. This is why. Because a lot of times we want an explanation for everything. And in most of these visions and in most of what we've read about so far, there's been a detailed kind of rollout of what this meant and what God was saying, but not this vision. 
This vision was different. This experience was not meant to be, it wasn't meant to be written. I think in a lot of ways God said, I, I, want, you to, I want you to wonder at this, John. This, this mighty angel, there's a lot of different commentary on this angel. Some people believe it might have been Jesus because it talks about he has this rainbow over his head in Revelation and talks, there's different similarities and I don't know for sure. I don't think so because it talks about how it, it is a, another mighty angel and we've, we've seen seven angels, se several angels in the book of Revelation um, that have been explained in great detail. But this angel was different. It was a mighty angel. Uh, I mean, it, it, I think that symbolism there of having a foot on the land and the sea is that this angel was, is, is, is going to encompass every, I think, person on the earth. It's a pretty beautiful illustration of what's of, of, of what this vision of what John is, is seeing, but these seven thunders, right? So God is speaking to John, and, and John says, okay, I'm on the job here. Maybe this is just another vision. I need to write down what's going on, and God changed it up on him. And I'm noticing in, in, in life that, you know, to keep the newness in our relationships, especially with God, sometimes we got to change it up. Sometimes the way that God moved in the past is not the way that God is going to move now. And sometimes the way that God revealed things in our life in the past is not necessarily how God's going to reveal them to us now. And with John, I love that this is there because this vision comes and he's, he's just taken his pencil like he has been for the last 10 chapters and wanted to write it. And God said, no, this is not to be written. I want you to wonder at this. One translation the message translation says it like this. When he started to write, a voice from heaven stopped him and said, seal this with silence. I want you just to enjoy this. I want you to experience this. I want you to wonder at this. And so these seven thunders, we don't know what it is. We don't know what, what God spoke to him. There's a, a parallel passage in the book of Psalms, Psalm 29. And so people way smarter than me connected the dots and, and I want to read it to you because it, it, there's, there's seven thunders, there's seven things that God says in Psalm 29. Perhaps this is what God spoke to John. It says, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord, there's seven times he says this. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry, glory. So what's the point? I think the point was that God wanted him to wonder a little bit. And as one of our elders, Dr. Doug Amen, when we're sitting down talking about this kind of stuff, because he's way smarter than me, <laughs> he says there's things that God asks us to just hold in a mystery. There's some things that we cannot understand. It's like trying to explain gravity to a caterpillar. You know what I'm saying? It's like it's trying to explain swimming in the ocean to a bird. There's just some things about God that maybe we weren't meant to understand. Maybe we were meant to wonder at it. Maybe it was something that, that we're, we're meant to, to peer into. And then what I love about this particular verse is that, that there's things that even John the Revelator held in a mystery in his life about God. And I think God wants to do that for you and for me too. I think he wants us to be walking in such a relationship with him that he's speaking things to you that maybe you wouldn't share with anyone. He wants you to hold it in a mystery. He wants you to wonder at him and his goodness, and his grace and his mercy, that there's things in your life that maybe God gives you that aren't for anyone else. It's for you. It's for you. And so I think one of the ways that God keeps us from losing the wonder in our life is he hides himself in mystery. Things about his nature. Things about what he's doing in the future. This book, the book of Revelation, if I could sum it up in one word, right? 
it's a wonder held in a mystery. Nobody knows. And everybody that thought they knew how to interpret this book were wrong for the most part. If you read several hundred years of commentary on this book and they started trying to connect the dots and saying, okay, this person is this person and, and this, this dragon represents this and there's all this imagery, you know, as history continues on, we find out that, that, that maybe they weren't completely right. Maybe this book is written as illustrative and as poetic as it is to just be wondered at. To marvel at the goodness of God. To know that, that there's a God in heaven that has a plan for this entire world. To know that there's not a moment that we go to sleep and we wake up in the morning that God doesn't have a plan. And I know for me that, that causes panic when I, don't, when I can't really see the future. Uncertainty is not somewhere where anyone wants to live. But knowing that there's one that holds the future in his hands brings a little certainty even in the midst of uncertainty. Knowing that there's things that God knows that maybe I'm not going to know, but he's got it. <laughs> like your future and your family and where this world is heading. It's, there's just things about God that we hold in a mystery. Socrates said that wisdom, wisdom begins with wonder. God wants us, I think, to be in awe of what he's doing. And a lot of times to stay in this place of wonder, he can't give us all the answers. Sometimes, you know, I think our intellect and what we know can get in front of, ahead of us, ahead of our experience with God. And there's one thing to, to write something and to know something, but it's another thing to experience it. It's another thing to, to, to be able to say, you know, I can tell you about baptism. I can try to explain it to you, but, but I, I, I once was lost, but now I'm found, right? I went down this way, but I came up this way. There's just some things about God. I mean, almost everything that I feel like I've experienced with God at this point was in a mystery at one point. Like at salvation, explain that to somebody. <laughs> How do you explain it? I don't know. Bishop uh, G.E. Patterson used to say, he's like, I don't, it's, he said, it's just salvation is a mystery. How can a brown cow eat green grass and give forth white milk? I don't know. It's a mystery. How can God take a, my, a black heart like mine and dip it in red blood and it come out white as snow? It's a mystery. There's some things in this faith that we hold in a mystery and God wants it that way. And on Pentecost Sunday, I can't think of a better experience that's held in a mystery. So, so 50 days after Easter, the disciples were in the upper room and they were just sitting around waiting on. They didn't know. Jesus said, hey, go to the upper room. I want you to tarry until power comes down from on high. Okay. So is this lightning? They, he didn't give them details. He just said, do what I say, and you'll know it when, it's, when, it sh when he shows up. Come on, it's like, like you're, no one's going to have to explain it to you. And so they tarried in this upper room. And, and, and I mean, some of you know the story, but some of you may not. And it says they were just, just reading the Bible, hanging out, eating food together, fellowshipping. <laughs> and then God just showed up in a powerful way, in a way that they had never experienced before. Maybe God wants to do that for you. I know you've been saved 37 years. <laughs> okay. I know you've been in church a long time. But maybe God wants it to give you a fresh experience. He wants you to wonder. He wants you to live with this expect expectancy in your life. Church is too predictable, y'all. And when it gets predictable, it becomes boring. I know exactly what they're going to sing. I know exactly what that preacher is going to sing. Some of you right now are trying to figure out where this is going, aren't you? I don't even know. So good luck, okay? <laughs> you try that out with me. I don't have the time. No, no, I, I have an outline. But, but it's, just, it's, it's just too predictable, right? Three points in a poem. Make me laugh, make me cry, and let, let me go eat. I'm ready to get to brunch. Come on. Like, it, it becomes too predictable. The last thing that the experience that these folks had in this book were predictable. 
There was nothing predicted. I mean, they, they were just kind of following God in blind faith and, and, and just, just obeying God on what he said last to them. That's the day of Pentecost. It was high highs and low lows. They didn't know what was going to happen. They just knew that Jesus said, get into the upper room and wait until you get power. So some things God hides in a mystery to cultivate wonder in our life. That there's just going to be things about God that I don't think that we'll ever be able to understand or exp explain. But he kind of wants it to like to stoke that fire, that passion, that zeal. So John has this incredible vision of this angel. And then at the end of this chapter, I want to read to you what he says. Verse 11, after he has this, this incredible vision, he sees this angel, something is, is kind of stirred in him again. He says, I, I've, I've got to prophesy. I've got to, I've got to tell the people and the nations and the languages and, and the kings. He's, he's given this mandate after this experience to go and share what he had seen. Revelation 11, if you turn one more chapter over, this is where we're introduced to the two witnesses. And so there's going to be a point in time, according to this book, that there's, uh, that there's going to be two witnesses that God has, uh, has ordained to kind of be, I don't know, function as the church. And nobody knows, there's all these versions of who, who these two witnesses could be. Some think it's Enoch and, and Elijah, because those are the two guys in the Old Testament prophets that never died. They were just taken up by God. And some believe it's Moses and Elijah, the Mount of Transfiguration. But I want you to, I want to read this and I want you to notice just a couple things about these two witnesses. It says, I'm going to appoint two witnesses. They're going to prophesy. They're going to speak for 1,260 days. And he describes them. They're two olive trees, two lampstands. Lampstands, underline that. See, because in the beginning of this book, the vision about the churches, he, he calls them lampstands. If you, don't, if you remember, go back a few weeks. So lampstands was used to describe the church, like us. And they stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone tries to harm them, check this out. They can breathe fire, okay? <laughs> My son would love this, all right? These are dragon people, all right? They can breathe. Fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. And so you can look at, you know, different paintings and illustrations. And, and so for thousands of years, a lot of folks have taken that literal, that maybe they're just going to be able to just take somebody out. Like, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's it. But today's Pentecost Sunday. I got to try to connect it. You know what I mean? That's just what I got. And, and it's interesting to me that in Acts 2, it said when the Holy Spirit came that each of them had cloven tongues of And the, that experience, that wonder that they had in that upper room changed them all. And Peter, who was denying Jesus just a few days earlier, who was scared of a little girl, I mean, who, who was trying to connect him to Jesus, he was afraid for his life. That same guy, after this experience on Pentecost, got out of that upper room and preached to thousands with boldness and power that he didn't have before. So maybe there's a connection. Maybe these two witnesses are going to be actual people that are going to be on this planet, that people are going to, are going to be able to receive truth from during the days of tribulation. Or maybe, maybe we're called to be witnesses. And what I love about... Acts 2 and these two witnesses, they really weren't given a lot of information. They were just sharing about their experience. The wonder of God. The faithfulness of God. Peter stepped out on Acts 2 and he preached just a, just a pretty straightforward sermon. But he talked about the wonder and the power of God. He talked about how that there's, that, you know, in, in that day, on the, on the, it's called the, the Feast of Pentecost. It just means 50 days it's after Easter. But on that day, every single nation was there in, in Israel. 
was represented. And the real miracle, you know, we talk about, you know, Pentecost, and we talk about that experience and how powerful it was, but maybe the real miracle was that the whole world heard the gospel in their language that day. It's almost God's answer and solution to the Tower of Babel. You know, the Tower of Babel, it was man's attempt to get to God, and at, at some point, apparently, everybody spoke the same language on this earth. And God confused the languages in Genesis 10 or 11, I think. But then it happens again, and God says, no, I'm going to give you the answer here. I'm, I'm going to give you this power that's, gonna, that's going to give you the ability to communicate and reach people that you could never communicate and reach on your own. This wonder, this experience, this upper room, it's cloven tongues of fire. Like this, I mean, it's imagery, it's a passion, it's, it's, it's God showing up, and, and, and it's an experience that I'm sure those 120 never forgot. And if you trace kind of their, their message from that point forward, it was, have you received the power of the Holy Spirit since you believed? So when was the last time that you wondered at something? When was the last time that you wondered at the goodness of God? Psalm 65, verse 8, the whole earth is filled with all of your wonders. Where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of glory. David knew about the wonders of God. Psalm 40, many, Lord my God, are the wonders that you have done. Or the things that you have planned for us, none can compare with you. Where I speak and tell your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Would you be willing to pray that prayer? God, I want to be, I want to stay in a place of wonder. I don't want to get dry. I don't, I don't want to get familiar with walking with you. I don't want this whole church thing to get too familiar. That's why I think we got we to change it up sometimes. God, I want to live in a place of wonder and awe. And I think the first step in that, we're going we're gonna to pray. That means I need a piano. Somebody help me. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> Got to get the devil off my back. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Those keys just. Would you be willing to, I don't know, ask God to take the ceilings off of your walk with him? Maybe you put them in a box, or maybe somebody told you that God doesn't do that anymore. God doesn't speak anymore. There's a whole camp of people called cessationalists. They believe all the miracles, all the signs and the wonders ceased with the 12 apostles. And they teach that, and they believe it. And they believe it, and that's probably their experience. <laughs> And that's the devil's workshop. He's the father of lies. And, and you know, some of y'all, I know some of you have read the screw tape letters by C.S. Lewis, pretty incredible about how the enemy tries to, to work in our lives. But if he can't get us just to walk out on God, he just wants us to get comfortable with religion. Just go through the motions. You've checked all the boxes. You're saved, you're baptized, just coast on. And I think it's my job to make you uncomfortable every now and then to say, point you kind of upwards and say, maybe, maybe God has more for you to experience on this side. That maybe God has some wonders that he wants to unveil in your life. And it could come in the beauty of a sunset. It could, could come in a moment when you're with him just walking through the woods. Could come on a Sunday morning, I don't know, but I believe God was once, he wants to fill your life with wonder. He doesn't want you to live bored. He doesn't want you to live stagnant. He doesn't want you to, to live this life, I think, just with words alone. I'm thankful for the words, but we need the wonder. Would you bow your heads and just... 
Pray that prayer with me. God, I want to take the ceilings off of my faith. I don't want to live off an experience that I had five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Will you fill my life with wonder? Will you just say it? Holy Spirit, will you you fill my life with wonder? Help me see that there are no ordinary people. (laughs) Help me see that there are no ordinary days. Help me see that there are no ordinary sunsets or sunrises, that everyone's a gift. God, we just thank you so much that you're good to us. That the last way you want us to live is bored. You want us to live like a little child with faith and expectancy and wonder. And so, Lord, restore the wonder in our soul today. Restore the wonder in relationships in our lives if they become stagnant. Restore the wonder, Lord, in just serving you and knowing you. How grateful are we to know the God that created the universe, spoke it into existence. How amazing is it that right now we're just spinning through space in the universe that you set in motion with just the words of your mouth, Lord. Restore the wonder. God, we are just thankful today. We're grateful. I pray for someone in here that maybe you just you feel like coming to church is really difficult lately. It's felt more like something you got to do. It's not something you do because you want to. You just feel like you're obligated. And it's just what you've always done. Lord, reach down into our hearts. Give us a fresh experience with you, Lord. Give us a fresh vision of who you are. Lord, show us, show us, God, that you're not through with us. Anyone in this room, you have more for them. You may have walked through a dry place the last several years. You may have walked through a place where it's just felt really difficult to pray and really difficult to read your Bible. But would you just pray, just, Lord, fill my life back again with that fresh wonder so that, I God, I'm looking forward to getting in your word because I want to see you. I'm looking forward to, to spending time with you, Lord, because I want to hear your voice, the wonder that the God of the universe would speak to me, to you. We thank you, Lord, and we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen.